everyone, happy Sunday. Today we are going to be looking at two old ladies of mine that I have in my personal collection. One of my first acquisitions and the other one is one of my most recent acquisitions that did not get an unboxing because it came in a box that was so big you could fit a body in it and there was so much stuff in this box that literally if I had filmed the unboxing we would still be watching it right now and it's like it would be like two weeks old at this point. I'm gonna show you all the stuff from that haul slowly over time instead of doing one big unboxing. Both of them have over 30 inch waists okay guys this is not the standard 24 inches smaller oh my god their waists were so small back then they were so small it's no these are like very normal people in fact one of these bodices i think was worn by someone of a certain age because of just the proportions and how it looks on the mannequin i've dubbed her mimo and then the other one is just like chef's kiss tailoring perfection. But before we go into it, I have a couple housekeeping notes. First things first, if you would like to know more about size inclusion in historic clothing, I highly recommend that you go and check out Costuming Drama's channel. I will put the link to that video up here somewhere. It features Costuming Drama or Noelle, Kenna from Kenna.Sews on Instagram, as well as myself, where we discuss the mythology behind size and the actual reality of sizes and garments throughout history. So we go pretty far back. More information about both of these garments, size inclusion, that myth, that's all going to be in that live stream that I did as a part of CoCovid with Noelle and Kenna over on Noelle's channel, which again is costuming drama. Second piece of housekeeping. Come here. Come here. There's a lot more of you now. Welcome. I'm really happy to have you here. We're going to have a good time. It's always a party on this channel. Weird stuff happens. Cool stuff happens. But I've noticed something that has shown up over the past couple weeks. And that is people not watching my earlier videos where I discuss the conservation of my collection and how I take care of my clothing. So this has resulted in some, well, frankly, condescending comments on my Instagram and YouTube channel where they don't need to be. Couple things. If you're curious about the concept of wearing gloves versus not wearing gloves for textiles, I have put some links to some articles in the description below. I do not wear gloves when I handle antique garments. This is how I was taught by curators, okay? The old school way of thinking was to wear cotton gloves. Cotton gloves are a terrible idea for handling textiles. Cotton gloves limit your tactile ability. You can't feel the garment, therefore you can't tell if you've put the garment under pressure or stress, thus resulting in the ability to actually tear or cause harm to the garment. Additionally, cotton gloves will snag and grip onto things that they shouldn't do that to, thus again causing harm. They also leave fibers behind. The other option is nitrile gloves. And while nitrile gloves are far and away the best option if you're gonna look at the scale of things, even compared to clean washed hands. Here's the deal guys, they're expensive. And two, we're in a pandemic right now. And frankly, I don't think it's wise of me to be wasting nitrile gloves on handling my personal collection where it's not necessary. So let's just stop bringing up gloves. I will never wear gloves on this channel to handle my clothing unless I absolutely think it's necessary. I buy a lot of wounded birds because these babies are never gonna go in a museum. They're never gonna be appreciated in a museum, but I'm gonna take care of them here. I live in a climate controlled dry climate garments are kept in archival boxes in the dark away from all sorts of heebie-jeebie vermin because that's the benefit of living in the desert it's so nice but i will not wear gloves i will never wear gloves on this channel if you don't like it you don't have to be here i would love for you to stay i would love for you to hang out but if this really upsets you i'm never gonna make you happy okay okay I'm glad we had this talk. As always, my hands are cleaned. They are de-ringed. We're ready to go. You ready to look at Mima? Oh, oh, Mima's a good one. Let me tell you, she's a real good one. Mima was one of my first acquisitions. It appears that Mima is from the early 1870s, possibly late 1860s. It is definitely bustle era, but it is not typical for 1870s and it's also not typical for 1880s. There's some weird trendiness happening with her front point here, but we have been able to find some 
fashion plate images that kind of have a similar sort of point to the front. It is a brown, slightly changeable silk taffeta with black velvet trim and black lace. On the inside, she has been lined in what is now a rapidly disintegrating brown polished cotton. You look at this thing funny and the cotton just bloop, it, Luckily, the silk is actually in really good condition, so the brown cotton will not last a very long time, but the brown silk will. So she's still safe to handle. We're just not gonna worry about it. We're gonna be as gentle as we can, but really, frankly, there's not too much we can do about it. It is, it is beyond the point of saving. We have a 35 inch waist. We have a 44 inch bust. Now, when we had Mima on the mannequin, what was fascinating about this is that the 44 inch bust circumference was actually predominantly focused in her back. Her front bust region was actually very petite. So so her circumference actually was focused in her back. And if you look at this back piece here, you can actually see it's pretty broad. Starting with the front, we have hook and eye closures just down the center front, about a one inch overlap of silk, but the very, oh, that's so cute. Oh, you did have a tum-tum. We knew you did. Oh, Mima. Oh, Mima, you've had to move these. Look at you. Okay, okay. So the hooks on this have been moved. It used to have more of a bust curve, but then it's gone in a little bit. You can see the scarring on the center uh, front here from where there used to be other hooks and eyes. But down here at her tum tummy, she has them moved out. So you can see a very distinct curve out. And when we had her on the mannequin, we kept patting out her little tummy because it was just like, oh, she needs more stuff there. Oh, she needs more stuff there. So Mima had this little tum tum. It was really cute because she's Mimo and she's Granny. The eyes are just along the edge and so they have not been moved. It's the hooks that have been moved. There was a hook up at the top of her throat. There is a bar there where the hook should have gone, but it does not exist anymore. There was a full length of baleen boning down the center front. There's still a little bit now, but it is all sorts of bent because obviously it's been worn and it's definitely broken so i don't know if they've removed some of it or if like it's broken and so just chunks of it have fallen off and gotten twisted around over time but it's in a little hand stitched casing out of the same brown cotton that has been cut on the bias just providing a little bit of structure right there at the center front so it has that center front boning it has one boning on either side on the dart and then there was at least a casing for a boning at one of the side seams it is now empty so it looks like this was just, the boning for this was just removed at some point Oh, bless. Okay. So this is not the alteration point where I thought it was, but there's a piece of boning at a alteration point where a dart was let out. All right, there's a piece of boning there. And then there's also a piece of boning here at the center back. So just a little bit of structure around the bodice to help keep it all together and keep it kind of laying very nicely. Arms are actually lined in a different type of fabric. It looks like actually two different types of fabric in the sleeves. Some of it's glazed, some of it's not, but part of that might just be that she's worn it away. I'm sweating because there are huge pit stains in this bodice, but there's also a gore and a, or a gusset, if you will, in the underarm of the sleeve to let it out. And that is actually lined in a different type of cotton. And this also has a fish dart taken in it. Depending on like the curve from your waist to your hip, sometimes there's just extra fabric here when you're fitting a Victorian bodice. And it this the easiest way to deal with it is you just take a little dart there. And the dart's called a fish. Oh, so cute. On one side, they had actually made a little watch pocket for it. And so they left the fish open at one little section that would just fit a perfect little pocket watch. And then they made a little baggie and that baggie is like screaming for, for mercy. Let's see, it's mostly machine sewn. The raw 
seams that exist, they have been overcast over in just like a per plain creamy cotton thread, which just seems pretty common. The seams are all stitched by machine. And then the sleeves are hand stitched in using a back stitch. And then the raw edge has been overcast over for so very, very standard. The trim, which is a black velvet trim that has black lace tacked to it, has been hand stitched as like the last thing. The stitches are completely visible in here. So there's a wide piece of silk facing that was stitched down first and the bodice was finished and then the silk was laid over top of it. I think that's basically it for the inside. Like I said, it's super duper rough. Alright, so the other piece that we're looking at today is a gorgeous, gorgeous, originally black wool ladies coat that has a label in it from where it was purchased and another non 25 inch waist garment. The center front pieces were cut on the straight, but then they were shaped to go over the bust and curve. So there's a very distinct curve out and then back in but then like the side piece here was definitely cut on the bias. We have gorgeous wool braid going down the front, around the collar, around the cuff here to trim it out. And it just creates this beautiful line, very subtle, very, very elegant. The coat itself comes from Mademoiselle Marie Pearson from East Orange, New Jersey. So this is an American mate. It has, with its altered waist, it was taken into a 29 inch waist. It actually originally was bigger than that. And it has slightly puffed gathered sleeves that we think this tape that goes over it might've been to kind of help bring them down at a later date. Cause this tape doesn't really exist anywhere else on the jacket, but it is in keeping with the overall theme. You know, I thought this thing was originally black and it just faded out to like this green color, but it might have actually been. No, it was actually just a really pretty dark green. So I take that back. It is not a black jacket. This is a dark green, almost black coat that's been trimmed in black. It's also lined in black silk taffeta, which is starting to shatter and there's wear spots on the wool as well. It is completely lined, no raw seams, beautifully, beautifully made. Now there is a huge alteration in this garment that goes up into the sleeve itself. Am I seeing this correct? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, it does. Holy. Oh my. Jeez. Jeez Louise. Okay. Wow. That's. That's one way to do it. That's not how I would have done it. But ladies and gentlemen. Where they started the alterations somewhere past the fullness of the sleeve and they just brought it out and kept taking it in until they reached hip level. Allowed it to be loose again. Wow. Okay. That really changes stuff. Mm-hmm. That really changes stuff. That is... So they did not line this up with the actual seam of the sleeve. It's just a little dart that is under the sleeve. And most of the mess is hidden by this tape. So yes, if I was a betting woman, this tape was to hide the janky, messy alteration that I don't think Mademoiselle Marie Pearson did. I think someone else did at a later date. She's probably rolling over in her grave right now going, how on earth could you do this to my beautiful piece of work? And I, you know what, Marie, you're right. How dare they? But it's still, even though it's super messy alteration, it still is a beautiful garment and it sits beautifully on a mannequin. <laughs> There's no pockets or anything like that that I can tell. If there were, they might have sh like, I don't see any evidence of anything like that. No cool secret pockets or anything fun. 
It has a nice vent cut out here, again lined. It looks like the seams are machine stitched, but then the lining has been hand tacked in with really nice stitches, just nice hand stitches. Arms eye seams are also completely bound and finished in a bias tape. Like there's a little bit of tailoring that's happening here. So it's not just the wool and then the silk. There is an interlining of what appears to be a linen or a cotton interfacing the wool itself is pretty thin so the body of this is the interlining of this nice linen cotton canvas that you can also see coming up through the moth holes so it is completely interlined as well so yeah this is just a very thin it's not horse hair it's like a thin cotton maybe tarlatan that is interfacing the back. So the back doesn't have the canvas, but it does have a very thin layer of interfacing. And then the front pieces here have the canvas interfacing. So this thing has been nicely tailored, but not over tailored. There's no padding, there's no wadding, but there definitely is structure within the wool itself. Oh, and the front closes with hooks and then bar tacks. It's thread bars that have been stitched. The sleeves were hand gathered. There's a knot here and some thick, heavy, thread that were used to gather up the sleeves. That's really cute. All right, everyone, that is it for me this week. I hope that you all enjoyed looking at these two very special garments with me. I think they are excellent historic pieces to have and a really great example of diversity in size in the past because not everyone had a 24 inch waist and a 32 inch bust. That just wasn't the norm. This is just a really great example of that. And again, if you all are interested in hearing more about this subject, I highly recommend that you go over and check out Costuming Drama and check out the busting myth size inclusion in historic clothing form that I did with Kenna. We go through these garments, we go through tons of other garments too, and just all sorts of delicious data. Other than that, I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your week. I will see you all here on Sunday with another video. If you like hanging out with me, go ahead and subscribe. If you wanna support the work that I do, I do have a Patreon. You will find the link to that down in the description below as well. I appreciate all of your all's time and coming here and hanging out with me and I look forward to seeing you all next week. I hope you all have an awesome week and I will see you all then.